manipulation of the steel's chemical makeup, the manufacturer discovered a formula that would result in a harder and much tougher rail. To measure hardness and toughness, hundreds of steel samples were made, each with minute adjustments or changes to the formula of chemical components. This is the machine used to carry out the experiment. Actually, the hardness and toughness of steel materials also changes greatly depending on the method of cooling. Hundreds of samples were tested using various cooling techniques. First, a sample is placed into the machine. Once the temperature reaches 1000 degrees Celsius, various tests are carried out as the metal cools. The sample is subjected to the same stresses a rail would be expected to tolerate. Next, the sample is heat treated and then the hardness and structure is evaluated. These tests were repeated hundreds of times which eventually led to the discovery of an optimum chemical composition and heat treatment method. This is the production line for the long life rails. The steel passes through several mills and is gradually shaped into rails. After this, the heat treatment process begins. Unfortunately, we couldn't film any further. provided by the manufacturer, the cooling method is as follows. As the rail enters the heat treatment equipment, its temperature is above 800 degrees Celsius. The rail is then cooled rapidly. This manufacturer uses an air cooling method instead of water. The important factors are the force of the air, its direction, and the timing of the blasts. Depending on the part of the rail, the force of the air is slightly changed. This precise method relies on technology only Japanese manufacturers utilize at present. This is how a long life rail is produced. These rails are often used overseas for lines with trains hauling heavy loads to reduce the cost of maintenance and replacement. In the future, this manufacturer plans to produce rails according to the precise demands of the railroad companies. It has become impossible to satisfy all the railroad companies because in the end, each has different requirements and expectations for their rails. In the future, we would like to propose a specific type of rail that would be best for each client. That's the level of technology we're aiming for. Japan's railway technology really is world class, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, well, Japanese rails, uh, not only they are very safe, uh, they're also very reliable and also uh, they need uh, less number of uh, replacement because uh, they're stronger against uh, wear and tear uh, when they're actually used in real operation. And that quality has been highly regarded by the uh, operators, not only within Japan but worldwide as well. Definitely, and that's the system's thinking, actually. Mm -hmm. And actually, Japanese-made wheels are also very highly regarded in the rail industry throughout mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So, let's take a look at just how they're manufactured. Mm -hmm. This wheel manufacturer in Osaka is the only one of its kind in Japan. Approximately 200,000 wheels are manufactured here every year. And around 50% of them are exported. The wheels are exported to 17 countries and regions around the world, such as Germany's High Speed Railway, the ICE, Union Pacific freight trains operating in North America, the subways of New York City, and railways in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. As you can see, Japanese wheels are being utilized by all types of railways. Wheels made in Japan are praised for having high durability. This manufacturer has been making wheels since 1920. 
1926, a loop line was created within the factory to conduct wear tests on the wheels. They've long been dedicated to research and development, and since the latter half of the 1960s, the company has been producing world-class wheels. The first feature of highly durable Japanese wheels is that they are wear-resistant. At the Railway Technical Research Institute in Tokyo, wear resistance evaluations are conducted on wheels brought in by manufacturers. Just as with rail manufacture, the key to wear resistance lies in the chemical composition of the steel. <laughs> Smelted iron ore produces pig iron, which also contains amounts of carbon, manganese, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and other elements. Elements other than the carbon are then removed from the iron, and the amount of carbon is adjusted. Just the right amount of carbon makes the metal harder and more wear resistant. Too much, on the other hand, makes it brittle. The final steel material is produced with a carbon content of 0.6 to 0.75%. This range is considered the optimum value for manufacturing wear-resistant wheels. The steel produced at the steelworks is then transported to the wheel manufacturer. The second feature of highly durable Japanese wheels is that they are crack resistant, or tough. If the toughness of the wheel is insufficient, deterioration such as shelling may affect the surface of the wheel, or thermal cracks can appear due to the heat produced by the brake shoes. These are just some of the ways that wheels can be damaged. The toughness of a wheel can differ greatly depending on the manufacturing method. There are two methods used when manufacturing steel components, casting and forging. Casting involves pouring molten steel into a shaped mold. Then, as the metal cools, it takes on the desired shape. It is inferior in durability, but because it's relatively cheap and quick, it's more suitable for mass production. Manufacturers in North America mainly utilize this method. On the other hand, forging is a method of molding steel by compressing it into a template. Since it uses a large-scale press machine, it's slower and costs more, but metallic density is also higher, so crack-resistant wheels can be produced. Japanese wheel manufacturers use this forging method. The main reason this manufacturer can create world-class durable wheels is their forging method. Steel from the steelworks is heated up to 1,250 degrees Celsius. The steel is then rounded using a 9,000 ton press. Then the mold is changed and on the second press the steel begins to resemble a finished wheel. Next, a wheel rolling mill shapes the wheel to a predetermined size. Finally, and the key part of the process, a rotary forging press further elaborates the wheel. Because the rotary forging press rotates, the upper mold is slightly tilted. This enables us to produce wheels with extreme uniform metallic density. Then, after forging the wheel, we make final adjustments as the steel cools. It's what we do during this cooling process, which ultimately dictates the hardness of the wheel. This manufacturing process produces wheels that are both wear resistant and durable. This manufacturer produces more than 200,000 wheels a year, while its affiliated company in the US produces a further 300,000. Between them, they currently manufacture approximately 10% of the world's train wheels. Saline and saline are set, but I thought that there was a difference between saline and saline. 
Yeah. Mm. Actually, in 2009, I heard that more than 7,000 Japanese wheels were ordered for Germany's high-speed ICE. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the car body, if I'm correct, the car body is manufactured in Germany, but right. the wheels, Japanese. Mm. Mm. That's right. And in fact, Deutsche Bahn or the German railway company had a bit of trouble coping with the wear and tear of the wheels of the high-speed train. Mm -hmm. And they have found that um, Shinkansen in Japan uh, didn't have a similar problem, and they have decided to run a comparative test. And after six years of tests, they have concluded that Japanese wheels were much better. Mm -hmm. And until recently, uh, the railway operators uh, outside Japan had a concept of um, making wheels as cheap as possible and replace that uh, whenever necessary. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently, uh, their concept has slightly changed and they, they wanted to have um, much more durable uh, wheels than before. And then, you know, uh, Japanese wheels had a much better chance in the world uh, than before. Mm -hmm. And actually, we just saw the manufacturing process, but of course, we couldn't see the whole manufacturing mm -hmm. process because of the industrial secrets and stuff like that. <laughs> but lucky for us, actually, these wheels behind us here were made by the exact same company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, actually, well, I'll tell you that this is called a corrugated wheel, uh, which is also, if I'm correct again, a Japanese design. Uh, those corrugated, corrugated wheels uh, have the better uh, withstandability against the uh, lateral force, uh, not just the vertical force that uh, wheels actually expected to uh, withstand. Mm. And that means, you know, the wheels can be designed much lighter uh, than the normal wheels. For example, this will probably be something like 15 kilograms uh, per, per wheel, uh, lighter than the original design, uh, which, you know, means that there are four wheels in a, in a bogey, and something like 60 kilos uh, per bogey of uh, weight production. And that's actually very significant. Railway topics. On December 6, the Konan Railway in Aomori Prefecture began test runs for its snow plows in preparation for the winter season. After checking the snow removal equipment, the snow plow began operations between Kuroishi and Hirosaki stations, a distance of around 17 kilometers. The trip took one and a half hours. <laughs> On December 25th, in Saitama Prefecture, Chichibu Railway's SL Chichibu Whiskey Festival train operated between Kumagaya and Chichibu stations. For this one-day event, cars were also hauled by a steam locomotive, while professional musicians aboard entertained passengers with a little jazz. Passengers also enjoyed local whiskey being sold on the train. <laughs> Relaxing on a steam train while sipping a little whiskey and listening to jazz. A great way for adults to while away a little time. So I think with everything we've seen, we can really appreciate that it's a combination of the wheels and the rails that's actually vitally important, not one or the other. So actually, I have a question for you, like a quiz. Yeah. What section of a line do you think has the biggest impact on the wear and tear of rails and wheels? I think sharp cuffs and the steep gradient. Perfect. Wow. Unlike a, a, a car tire which has tread, you know, a train wheel is just a flat surface, and then the rail head, the top of the rail, is also flat. So curves and well, sharp curves mm -hmm. and steep gradients are, yes, the most difficult mm -hmm. place. Well, then one more question. Oh. Well, probably you know the answer already. Uh, which railway in Japan has the steepest gradient um, uh, within Japan, of course? Mm -hmm. mm. Which railway? Oh, 
going for the big way. You're right. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I didn't actually limit uh, the steel wheels and steel rails that railway, but uh, you're right. If you limit, uh, limit the uh, lines to that, then uh, it's definitely the Hakone Land Railway. And that railway has the steepest gradient of 80 per mil. Mm. That means uh, if the train travels for uh, 1,000 me 1, meters on, on the horizontal uh, direction, and then it will climb up 80 meters. And that means uh, 80 in 1,000. Uh, and in other words, it, it's 8% per mm. And uh, in Japan, there's, uh, there's a government regulation that limits the maximum gradient of the railway to uh, 35 per mil. And if you want to build a railway that exceeds that limit, mm. then uh, the railway company has to come up with the countermeasures uh, so that they can operate safely on the steeper gradient, uh, like a uh, stronger brake system and that sort of thing. And the um, Hakoneto Dam Railway uh, did come up with that sort of solution. And uh, they were granted special permission to actually build that. Mm. Sounds something interesting. Mm. So, let's take a look at the special measures that Hakone Tora Railway took to overcome the street gradient. Mm. The Hakone Tozan Railway is located in the west of Kanagawa Prefecture. It's a 15 km long line that connects Odawara Station to Gora Station. The area is one of Japan's most famous hot spring resorts. Many tourists visit here when the hydrangeas bloom in June and also during the autumn season. Recently, there's been an increase in the number of tourists visiting from overseas. In roughly nine kilometers, the train runs from Hakone Yumoto Station, which sits at an altitude of 96 meters, to Gora Station at 541 meters, an incredible difference of 445 meters. In order to operate on such steep slopes, several unique measures have been put into place. For the train to be able to operate on short curves, the vehicle is only 15 meters long, and high output motors are attached to all the axles. In other words, it's an all-wheel drive train. There's also something unique about the wheels themselves. Compared to those on conventional trains, these wheels help to generate more traction. We need to generate more traction than usual, and to do so, we use cast iron brake shoes. The brake shoes create irregularities on the surface of the wheels, and that improves the adhesion coefficient when the surface of the wheel comes into contact with the rail. I see, so the brake shoes make the wheels rougher and that helps the train to grip the rails. Clever stuff. Soon after the train leaves Hakone Yumoto Station, it climbs a slope with an 80 per mil incline. Thanks to the power of 12 motors, the three-car train is able to climb the slope with ease. Next comes another challenge. 30 meter radius curve, considered to be one of Japan's sharpest curves. But measures have also been taken to pass through sharp curves like this. The driver pushes a button, and then water is sprinkled onto the rails. oil is often used and sprinkled onto the curves to prevent wearing and noise. But the Hakone Tozan Railway uses water. Why is that? We decided not to use oil, and instead set up water tanks on the cars, which then sprinkle water onto the rail-like curves. Using water instead of oil ensures the wheels are not affected on straight sections too. If oil is sprinkled when the train enters a curve, the oil can stay on the wheels, which can then make the wheels slip on steep gradients. To avoid this potential problem, the Hakone Tozan Railway sprinkles water. Approximately 40 minutes after departing Hakone Yumoto Station, the train arrives at the final stop, Gora Station. 
Now the train will be going back down the steep slope it just climbed. The train is equipped with a special brake to help cope with the steep descent. It's called a track brake. The track brake is located between the wheels. It's forced against the rails using air pressure. It's rarely used, but it's a function unique to trains that operate on steep slopes like this one. It's because of unique measures like this that the Hakone Tozan Railway's trains are able to operate on some of the sharpest curves in Japan and some very steep slopes. Mm. Well, the uh, Hakone Tozan Railway was built uh, with preservation of scenery in mind, so they didn't want to uh, cut the side of the mountain uh, to pass, uh, let, let the tracks pass. And so uh, instead they have uh, installed a sharp bend, like a 30 meter radius curve. And when trains uh, negotiate curves, uh, it is more general. Uh, to um, use oil uh, to prevent wear and tear of the wheels. But instead, Hakone Tozan uh, decided to use water spraying. And that actually helps uh, very much when the train actually wants to climb up the steep gradient because the friction does not uh, reduce very much compared with oil. And that has been a very good idea. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I learned so much today, lots of new things that are unique Japanese railway technology, so it's been fantastic today, I had lots of fun. Mm. Well, that's all we have time for, we hope you enjoyed the program, but we look forward to seeing you on the next Japan Railway Journey. So, come on, we'll see you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>